everybody and welcome to another episode of Cruising Israel. I'm your host, Natalie. And I'm Max and I hope you're ready for the show because we got lots of great stuff for you this week. So Natalie, right. what's going anyway, on? Anyway, Max, so we visited many, many farms around the country, right? From the north to the south. I love visiting farms because it's very different from where I'm from. That's New York true. City. We've been to dozens of them here across the country. Yes, we have been to dozens. Um, but what do they all have in common? They're all using that same drip irrigation system. Oh yeah, system. the Israeli drip irrigation. They're always really proud to show us this feature yeah. at every single exactly. farm. It was developed right here in Israel. They're still going strong, always inventing new you know, systems to improve the life of a farmer and to improve the world of agriculture. Why don't we go check them out? Cool, sounds interesting. We're gonna meet some of the people working there and yes. check out the stuff. The company's called Netafim. Interesting. Okay, so let's go. Let's do it. Israel has been known worldwide for breakthroughs in the agricultural industry. And today we're going to visit a place that not only pioneered these innovations, but remains industry leaders in the world of agriculture. A drought or an ongoing lack of water is every farmer's worst nightmare. And here in Israel, the agricultural community is no stranger to arid, dry conditions. One company has revolutionized the way farmers use water, allowing producers to grow plants which yield a bigger quantity of better quality crops, all while using less resources. So you can grow a cornfield when you flood irrigate it, and you're gonna probably use around, for one hectare, around 12,000 cubic meters to grow that, that hectare of corn. When you switch to drip, you're gonna save 50% of that water using around 8,000 or 7,000 cubic meters for that same hectare. That's a lot of water. The original drip irrigation product manufactured by Israeli company Netafim pioneered the drip revolution. It's a type of micro-irrigation system which allows water to drip slowly to the roots of the plants, where the water is absorbed directly by the roots, minimizing evaporation and other forms of wastewater. So, first of all, we have the FlexNet, which is draw all across the field. Uh, it's a fle flexible pipe, uh, which can go in and out uh, very easily uh, from the field. And then to each one of them, uh, we connected the dripper lines and uh, all across the dripper lines, we have the drippers, as you can see over here. We are putting the exact amount of water uh, in each one of these areas um, next to each one of the plots. So we're not just flooding the water, flooding the, the entire field. This gives farmers the chance to know precisely how much water or fertilizer their crops are getting. So the water goes in into the, uh, into the yeah. dripper lines from here. Yeah, it goes all the way here. It goes up from the pressure, and uh, there's anti-clogging uh, uh, capabilities here, uh, flushing it in directly into the, uh, um, into the pipe. Only clean water goes out uh, from uh, the hole in a very precise and accurate way. So when you're first looking at this, it looks like such a simple solution. Yeah. Like, I it is. Not people don't think about it's this simple, but it's sophisticated. But it, then again, once you're getting you're going into the details into it, of it, there's exactly. a lot of... There's a lot of thought of it. It's micro product, which is uh, protected by, uh, by many patents, but produced here only in Israel, only in Hatzerim. So far, millions of farmers in more than 110 countries are using precision irrigation to grow crops while using less water. The system has also become more advanced over the years by adding new feature sets which offer expanded capabilities which are making life easier for the farmers while also increasing overall profitability. Okay, so here we can see different types of uh, dripper lines that we have. Uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, the thin line, uh, which is more of a single season or two season that you can use. After one season, enjoy it out, recycle it, and then uh, in the next season, put out. You see it's very thin. And then the more uh, thick ones, which can uh, stay five or up to 10 years, it's much more rigid, much more tough. What if a farm is more slanted and it's, or, or it's very steep? Okay. A lot of the water would rush down the pipe. Is that yeah. also controlled? Of course. We have uh, what we call a pressure compensated drippers. We able to manage the pressure to be equal and even all across the pipe of the hill. And we are making sure that each one of the drippers is putting the exact same amount of water all across the pipe. Netafim is home to a research and development center and a few different greenhouses, from simple ones to advanced glass houses. Their wide range of products and solutions cater to growers of all sizes, from small to large-scale agricultural producers. So here we see different types of application for our products. For example, here, this is based on gravity, no electricity. Water goes up, 
and then goes down by gravity into these pipes and then irrigated. That's, uh, I would say, simplest example of, uh, of the drip. And then from here we're moving into the more sophisticated ones. Natafim's high-end greenhouse solutions are based on hydroponics, the process by which crops are grown without using any soil. This is the uh, disinfection tank, so everything here is in a closed loop, okay? All so the water, water is reused at all Exactly. The time. They took dialysis machines from hospitals, cleaned them up, and then using it to sterilize water. In each one of these, they have uh, different uh, fertilizers. It goes here into this machine, inject it, and then back. Everything is on the ground. Drainage, uh, disinfection goes into here, and then goes back. Although this method does consume a lot of energy, it saves a tremendous amount of water. These are water with nutrients going directly over here. You see the slope. Yeah. Everything is drained over there, being collected, and then recycled again. This is basil. These are strawberries. No spraying. Everything is clean. No chemicals. So it's very, very efficient. When you think of a farmer, you don't really think of someone that's so tech savvy. Um, but nowadays scientists work side by side with farmers and everything is super easy with a click of a button on their phone. Exactly. So Farming is becoming much more techy, uh -huh. uh, much more uh, uh, sophisticated on one hand, but simple on the other hand, because at the end of the day he needs to operate his farm. He needs to make sure everything is working. With Netafim's innovative ways of monitoring and controlling the farms, the process has never been more metered and precise. Over there we can see the tubes stuck into yep. the ground. These are the sensors which can sense the moisture and the temperature of the ground, mm -hmm. transmitting, uh, connected to this machine, to this uh, RTU, and then transmitting everything here to the main uh, control unit. The main control unit puts all of the automated controls in a central location and is the first system to integrate monitoring, analysis, and control. So what does the future hold for Netafim and global agriculture? The systems of the future are poised to be even more sustainable with higher efficiency, embracing Netafim's philosophy of doing more with less. Every farmer from the palm of his hand, like he's doing a lot of other things in his life, navigating, uh, getting advices, uh, managing his bank account, he should be able to manage his irrigation and his crop from the palm of his hand, and that's where global agriculture is going. Wow, that Netafim was cool. It's, you know, we've seen those tubes all over. They almost seem like ubiquitous to us now, but who knew that there were so many cool controls and features behind this whole yeah. system? Well, I thought it was such a simple system, but after going there and learning all about it, it's actually really complex. And it's also cool to know that farmers around the world, around the U.S., are using an Israeli invention that's made right here. Very cool. Such a tiny country and so many big innovations that make their way all around the world. Listen, Max, I am giving you the opportunity to take us to the next item. Okay, I got a great okay, one. Okay, the next restaurant, because I'm hungry, I don't know about you. I got a good one. I got a good one. There's yeah. a new place. It's been the talk of Tel Aviv. People are really excited about it. Not the most healthy place, and you okay. might get a little bit uh, sloppy there eating it, <laughs> but it'll be Here worth there, it. Here there, it's okay. It's delicious. I think it'll make a great uh, piece for the show. Let's go check it out. So what happens when one of Tel Aviv's most well-known chefs decide to open up a street food spot? It becomes the talk of the town and creates a huge buzz on social media. If you're wondering what's the latest and greatest eatery to add to Tel Aviv's long list of alluring restaurants, it's Chef Guy Gamzo's latest creation. Okay. <laughs> this spot sits in South Tel Aviv on bustling Herzl Street, a major street with many other trendy restaurants as well. And even though it's brand new, it already has everyone talking. It's amazing! It's one of the best things I've ever eaten in my life. I haven't even worn a bit since I was a child. It's so messy, but it's so good. It's actually my second time here in two days. That's how good this is. 
Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I'm gonna come back and probably try everything on the menu. It's amazing. Half of this is enough. What? I can eat like 20 of these. Oh. All right, so let's take a look at the menu. It looks like everything comes in lachmaniot. A lachmaniot is actually a bread roll in English. It looks like they have a lachmaniot with cheesecake in it. Lachmaniot with mac and cheese. Ice cream with um, chicken, barbecue. Wow, I have to try one of these. It's a milk-based bun. It's something between challah bread and brioche. And is the bread made fresh here? Uh, basically, yes. We have, a, we have a bakery really close by. Uh -huh. but we do it uh, three, four times a week. Try to make it every day. This isn't the first place Guy has launched. He already has a successful restaurant where he gained reputation for creating delicious contemporary cuisine in a fine dining atmosphere. Alia is a very different kind of restaurant. It's, uh, yeah. I've been there a couple of times before. It's yeah. more elegant, it's fancy food. And this is completely the opposite, it's like night and day. If you think about it, we give so much attention to the bun, so much attention to the bun itself, and so the details are very, need to be perfect. Yeah. So in a way, it's almost the same. I mean, you sell one product and it's only a bun and street food with fillings, but we treat it like it's a chef restaurant. Yeah. So as you see, it's very simple. We searing the, we sear the, the buns with the clarified the butter. It basically looks like oil, but it's only the oil from the butter. Searing the bun from both sides, giving it a crispy and nutty uh, taste. So when you take the bite, you get the crispiness from the outside and it's like a cloud inside. And the sauce is like basically like hollandaise sauce based on yolks and butter, a little bit of lemon and thyme, a little bit of chive, chive for the freshness. And the shrimp, what I'm doing, I'm cooking it on uh, Ben Marie. Above all, a little bit of chive again. That's it. So it is recommended to put this on before you're eating. Because things are about to get very messy. Mm. Oh my god, the bread is amazing. It's so fluffy and fresh and warm. Now I know why. They included dirty dining in the name of the restaurant. That was delicious. I think I'm gonna try everything on the menu. I'm not even kidding. Yeah, really tasty stuff. So Honestly, yummy. it was hard to hold the camera when I get that hungry. And I you know, wanna take I a bite. You. I saw you really wanted to eat. Yeah, but I can't get my any butter fingers on the camera. Yeah, that's true. So, I got an item for us now. I've been wanting to go for a long time, and I think the viewers will appreciate checking it out. There is a kibbutz here in Israel, in the north that was set up and established by people who survived the Holocaust, and specifically the Warsaw Ghetto. Mm -hmm. And there's a museum there that covers many different aspects of their experience, from the times of the Jews in Europe through the Holocaust and even towards today. You know, when you think about a museum dedicated to the Holocaust, your mind goes straight to Yad Vashem, the biggest museum here um, in Jerusalem. But let's go visit. Let's yeah, go visit there's so one. many aspects of the human experience, and a lot of them are covered in real depth at this museum, I've heard. I, I really look okay. forward to checking it out. So let's do, let's it, do it. it. As the number of Holocaust survivors continues to decline, it's never been more important to keep their memory alive and preserve their story for generations to come. Today, we came to northern Israel to check out the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, which houses a state-of-the-art and expansive museum. Founded in 1949, Kibbutz Lochamei HaGetaot, or Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz, was established by a group of 150 Holocaust survivors. 
אנחנו, בזה שנשארנו בחיים, חווים לנו חוב למתים, ועלינו לעשות לי זכרם. Today their legacy continues as the kibbutz features a museum commemorating those who perished in the Holocaust. The museum offers more than 10 exhibitions exploring the history of resistance against the Nazis and also covering Jewish identity and the story of the Jewish people in Europe before, during, and after the Holocaust. The war uh, is a process. Mm -hmm. World War II and the Holocaust wasn't started just in a moment. Mm -hmm. It was a process, and it started with uh, things that Jews are not allowed to do anymore, but the children, they don't understand. So, uh, like this uh, young uh, girl that she's standing and holding uh, um, signs that say you are not allowed to enter if you're a Jew, but she's smiling. Mm -hmm. This exhibition called Yad La Yeled focuses on the child's perspective, exploring in depth the point of view of the children who lived through the Holocaust. Authentic stories, real historic artifacts, photos and multimedia help to preserve their stories for future generations. These are actual pictures of the signs that were placed around the city? Around all, around, uh, all over Europe. It's in different languages. At the start of the Holocaust, they were trying to completely separate the yeah. Jewish people From, by not letting them yeah. in certain places yeah. and the Jewish star to identify themselves. Now we enter to one of the touching uh, areas in the exhibition. It's talk about living home, being a refugee. From the phrase, that say I wanted to take my clown with me. Mama said the suitcase was already closed. This is when everyone had to get up and move yeah. out of their homes, take all of their belongings. As you can see here, we have a authentic wow. example of a clown mm -hmm. that uh, was belong to a girl. She uh, departed with her mother. Uh, to a camp and she lived there till the end of the war. Each room simulated different aspects of life in the Warsaw Ghetto, using expansive sets and spaces. The path of the exhibition snakes around in a downward spiral, and as you work your way through the exhibit, the floor continues to slope in a way which symbolizes the trauma the children endured. So this yeah, is so, how most of the, the yeah. houses and buildings looked like at that time. There are authentic photos that try to expose the visitors to children's daily life in the ghetto. The concept of childhood uh, has changed during the Holocaust. Children have to take responsibility for their families. Mm -hmm. They have to take care of their parents. They try to get food for the families. All so, of a sudden, the children yeah. are becoming the caretakers. Yes. They have to be yeah. the ones. They feel like responsible yeah. to help their families. Yes. One of the most uh, important and interesting thing in the core exhibition is the testimonies. They tell about uh, their effort to support their family during the ghetto times. So they say how they try to get food for the family, how they uh, jump over the walls. Because of the children's size, they were able to sneak into places where no one else could, either for smuggling food for their families or just simply in order to hide. The exhibit ends in the memorial room, where a large projector screen plays back interviews of people who survived the Warsaw Ghetto. This is uh, Yudita Onon. She established the dancing company in the kibbutz and they made something meaningful for the universal and for the world. She forced to dance in Auschwitz in the, while she stood in the snow without shoes. She said, if I survive, I'll dance all my life. And that's what happened. So she took something traumatic and she made it positive. Yeah, yeah. Another good example is Yanka Levensira. Mm -hmm. He survived and became an actor. And he was a very 
comic actor. We try to bring uh, happiness to the world. It's very important to finish the, the, uh, the path of the exhibition, the story, with an uh, optimistic uh, point of view. In this room, a memorial lamp burns to keep their memory alive, reminding visitors that there's always hope, even in times of despair. Another exhibit here at the museum focuses on the trial of Adolf Eichmann, a senior Nazi who was responsible for organizing the deportation and eventual mass murder of millions of Jews during the Holocaust. So we have here the real booth that Eichmann sat during his trial in Jerusalem. We can hear here by the headphones uh, some of the testimonies. That, that took taken. place at the trial? Yeah. Uh, we have here uh, sentences that Eichmann himself said during the trial. The trial went on for four months and was widely covered by the international press. All these people are sitting there as Israelis during the 60s who are hearing well, some of them for the first time about these massive stories about the camps, about the ghettos, about the rebels, because the state need them as a witnessing according to the Eichmann accusation. Then they get the whole picture that the Holocaust is much bigger than what they thought. So this was their opportunity to spread awareness and let the word out, even if it's very shameful. Eichmann was found guilty of war crimes following the trial and was then executed by hanging in 1962. Each year at the kibbutz, at the very place where the survivors held their first memorial assembly, their tradition is continued. The open-air theater is visited by many people from across Israel, including Holocaust survivors and their families, members of various youth movements, and others who are touched by participating in the memorial. Everyone, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Cruising Israel. We hope you enjoyed the program. Don't forget to catch us next time as we cruise the country and show you the best Israel has to offer. Bye. Bye.